Okay, it's uh, Tuesday, September 8th. It's about 10 after seven. And this is Central Florida Computer Society's Linux Special Interest Group. And it's a monthly special interest group on the topic of Linux. And let's see if I click here and then click right. There we go. <clears throat> Our agenda tonight, pretty much in the same order as we did before, a uh, little informal discussion before we get into our topics. At Sean's suggestion, uh, I will add a round robin session where each of you gets to tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Linux. And then uh, we'll finish it up with a, a short demonstration of Zarin, which is a, a distro that I've been investigating. And we'll talk a little bit about resources and recommendations for follow on topics. Let's see what I showed as my next slide. Okay, so let me stop screen sharing. And welcome, Ken. Each of you has your own computer on, I see. The mine's bigger. <laughs> okay. So most of you probably know what we've been doing in the past, but just to bring those up that are watching the video for the first time, um, the Central Florida Computer Society authorized the purchase of a Lenovo laptop. And we, we started back in May, if I remember correctly, with our first session. <clears throat> and we actually walked through the installation of Linux Mint version 20.2. Two, I think, with a video taken in part with my cell phone mounted on a tripod so that you could actually see the installation progress, which is almost impossible to capture live on a Zoom conference. So you either do a video and then insert that into a Zoom conference or you do it live like we did. So for those that are just thinking of installing Linux Mint, the Central Florida Computer Society does archive each month's uh, special interest groups and uh, on YouTube. So that video is available should you wish to go back and follow along step by step with the with the installation of, of Linux. And then in subsequent months, we talked about what's included with Linux Mint. We looked at some of the applications. We went through different methods of installing programs. And last month we looked at some utilities and we didn't have a chance to finish up. And so we have um, the uninstalling software portion to finish, which is pretty short. And then tonight we will talk a little bit about the utility of the month, which is bleach bit. So um, any questions as to what we've accomplished to date by any of you that are with us now. Okay. Real quick, Mike, I sure. looked at installing uh, Vival Vivaldi. Anyway, it had Ubuntu and, and Debian, and I didn't know which one to choose then. Like there were different uh, ones to choose. I'm not sure. So I, I wasn't sure and I didn't go any further. Well, if you look at my background, <clears throat> I am. That is the family tree or a section of the family tree that you can get if you go to the distro, uh, distro what? Distro, I have to mind blank. But there's a site that's just got distro watch. That's it, distrowatch.com. And then if you ask for the family tree, it actually will bring up this great big long graphic document that shows how Linux descended from four basic families to where we are today. So Debian is the great grandfather or the great great grandfather, if you will, of uh, Ubuntu. And Debian itself has different family trees that branch off of it that are of the same generation that Ubuntu is. So you could in fact do Vivaldi off of of Debian, but you could also do it off of Ubuntu. 
And okay. Ubuntu would be more of the same generation that Mint is. Okay. So, so Mint is a grandchild, if you will, of Debian and uh, Mint is the child of, uh, of Ubuntu. Okay. So. Perfect. Sort of, it, it still says, you know, you're welcome to do it at any level. If you have, you've installed Mint and you know it works. So if you want to try a different distro and you want to see what Vivaldi looks like, <clears throat> I'd recommend it off of the, uh, the Ubuntu family tree. All right. I tried one other thing. I used pCloud and okay. I put a uh, file up there that I sent to my Linux and it was an Excel file and also a Word document file and a CSV file. And I sent them all to Linux and I downloaded them and none of them would open from pCloud, not one of them. So I thought that was rather interesting. Now the extension on one was doc, one was Excel and one was CSV. So I found that rather interesting. And I thought, well, do I have to change them all on my windows to the LibreOffice extension? No. no. And what, it shouldn't have, right? But one, the docx document was encrypted. Uh, but it never came up where I could unencrypt it. Now, are, you said pCloud. Did you previously you you had talked about Proton Mail and sending something that was encrypted? So right, now, I'm how, not worried about that. How did, I put a, I put a file? I put these three files up to see if I could transfer a bunch of stuff, like because I'm not paying for Proton, a bunch of stuff, and I so these were my three trials. Okay, and they didn't work. So I'm still, I'm not done experimenting with that. I just wanted to share. I tried it from pCloud, which is, you know, open source. And they were all downloaded, but nothing would open. Okay. So those are my only two things to open up. When you yeah. tried to open, did you double click or did you open uh, LibreWrite, for example, and then from LibreWrite say file open and then try to open the doc? I didn't open Libre first, no. You might want to try doing that just in case the default application uh, hadn't yet been set to LibreOffice. All right. And the same thing with Excel, it's Libre Calc. Right. And what was the third document or the third? CSV. CSV? CSV. Well, yeah. CSV I'd open with, try to open with Calc also. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So let me go to sharing screen again. Okay. So continuing from last month, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uninstalling software. You've got software on your computer and you get tired of it and for one reason or other you want to uninstall it so now we stop sharing and we go to computer number two fingers crossed <laughs> and we shall see if this thing works share screen okay we get those black boxes again that John and I have worked so hard to get rid of and they're still there. So we'll just stick with it. Okay, so here's Linux Mint. It is on the Lenovo. And I'm going to, I'm tired of Opera, which is an alternative browser. We went through the installation of Opera. So there's a couple ways to do this. Very straightforward from the menu, I can go to the internet and I can find Opera is here and I can right click on it. And you can see that I have an uninstall button. Again, pretty straightforward. So I will uninstall it. What's my password? And uh, packages to be removed, okay. 
I could actually see the terminal commands that it's doing. Now it's interesting, it's probably gone from the menu. Let's take a quick look. Let's look under internet again. Yep, it's gone. But unlike Windows, it doesn't automatically get rid of your icon. So I'm gonna just move the icon to trash because it's no longer there. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so another way to do this, if you wish, is go to your software manager. You go to the software manager, In the software manager, you can say show installed applications. You get a list of your installed applications. And let's see if there's something I don't particularly want. I could get rid of Zoom and then that takes care of this, doesn't it? Uh, let's see what else we've got that I've got that I'm not using Team Viewer. I well, I can reinstall Team Viewer with no problem. So let's just, you know, let's just go to Team Viewer since I'm not using it. And you can see from this application, I can choose remove. And you can see it telling me I can install it again if I want to. And same situation, let's make sure it's off of the menu structure. Yep, it's off the menu structure. And I will move the icon to, whoops, I think something else went along with it. I'll have to look at trash and see what, uh, what else I might've gotten rid of. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, Waterfox was installed I did I hear a question? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I, uh, I was just wondering, um, do you know where the preference files are kept and if those are removed as well? For the uh, they should be in et cetera. And then in a folder of the same name as the program. But what so, about the pers personal preferences? I think it's all in, in et cetera. I think so. But that's a good question. So I will hang on to that and report back. If I also, John it's it's the opera is still down on your panel. Aha! Uh -huh. You have you to right click right. that to get rid of it. Looks looks like yeah, unpin from the panel. Unpin. Yep. Okay, yep. and that sends it to trash, right? Should well, unpinning will just get stop it from being pinned. Uh, the desktop yep. actually sent it to trash. Okay. Let me so just, where, when you unpinned it, where did it go? It just flat deleted. It disappears. It. Yeah. Okay. Let's All see right. if I have there's trash. So let's see what we've got. There's Opera Stable. In fact, the whole thing from Opera apparently went to uh, trash and not just fully deleted. Uh, what else we got? Team viewer went there. Oh, here we go. There's the Opera desktop icon went there. Uh, the team viewer desktop icon went there. Previously, I'd gotten rid of flight gear. And previously, I had deleted Zoom and then reinstalled the latest version. And previously, I had gotten rid of Proton VPN as a as a full installation on this on this particular computer. So you can see this is where that went. Okay, so let me see though if I can get to etc. And let's see if we have something for well all right I have chromium on my computer right now. So let's see what's in here. Master preferences, I guess. So when I when I make settings, let's see if I edit this. Office with other application. It's open with text editor. Okay. Okay, so here's how things get stored. 
in most cases in Linux, there's a configuration file of some sort. And it's usually in et cetera, and then the name of the program. And you yourself, if you do the research, can go into these configuration files and you can configure them. For example, as, as, as we are looking at under Chromium, under distribution and import bookmarks, it says false. Now, I did not go in here and set that to false, but when I set Chromium up, I probably clicked on a button that had previously said import bookmarks and I had said no. So just the process of doing that automatically using the computer's AI went into this master preference file and set that to false. Uh, I went into Chromium and I said, show the home, home button and I clicked yes in the little box. So it came in here to this file and set it to true. Hey, Mike. Yep. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to question that because I don't know. I asked the question because I don't know the answer. However, um, on the Mac, which is actually Unix, um, your personal preferences, well, let me, uh, I'll frame it this way. When I open a program on the Mac, it looks for the personal preferences, which are located somewhere in a hidden space in my home folder. If there is none there, it will then copy the preferences, the default preferences from another location outside of my home folder, like under Etsy, like where you are, where you just were. So I was just wondering if there's a, I know on the Mac they're located in library preferences, but that's just, that's a Mac thing, but I'm wondering where on the, if it would be a different place on Linux but in the home folder. Can you look inside of your home folder and uh, see if there's any preference lists in, listed in there? And I would look in mine, but I don't have my computer with me right now. It might be a hidden folder too. <clears throat> Let's see. There's cache, config. There's, okay, there's Chromium. And scroll, yeah, scroll down. Keep going. So there's, hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's in et cetera, because you and I have been doing some research on networking and working with Samba and the settings for Samba are in that et cetera, even though it's me doing it, you know, with, with my files and my sharing. And yeah, but only... Samba, is a, Samba is a system wide resource. True. Uh, that you probably would not have personal preferences. I'll, I'll look it up. I don't, I'll, okay. can, I'll answer the question. I'll try to find it while during this session. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm not, let me just double check whether Waterfox, we did a script to install Waterfox. Now, I don't think I can uninstall it from the menu, but let's just take a look and see. Yeah, uninstall. Well, it's there. Yeah, so it looks like I can uninstall it. Previously with Waterfox, I know if I run that same installation script um, from the terminal, the very first question is install or uninstall. So this may somehow do the uninstallation, which I have no need for, for it anyway. So let's see what happens. Let's make sure it's not grayed out. No, it's there. Let's see what it does. Ah, okay. I didn't think so. No. Okay. So 
in order to uninstall Waterfox, I'm going to have to run the script again. And I have what I have to do is put that script in the same folder that Waterfox is located. And I don't think it's in there. I think it's in my download folder. And then I have to go to the terminal and I have to run it from the terminal. And then in the script, it'll ask me if I want to remove it. And then there's the commands necessary in the terminal to remove it. So I'm not going to tie this group up but with going through step by step by step. So it, it's just a third way of doing things if you installed something with a script. So primarily uninstall is either done from the menu, which is the easiest. If it's something that either came with, with uh, Linux Mint or something you added to Linux Mint and it was done with a Debian package or similar and put on the menu, then the ability to uninstall it will be in the menu. And then you can just pick what you want and uninstall it. So I'm not gonna do it, but like uh, this MPV media player came with Linux Mint and there's the uninstall for it. Uh, Hypnotics, which is a watch TV program, it's there as well. Celluloid, which is play movies and videos, it's there. And then same thing, now this one I did add myself from a Debian package and it's there. So questions on using the Linux controls in Mint to delete programs. Okay, I won't jump back to the agenda. I have it open on my other computer. The next item is the utility of the month, bleach bit. So um, in Windows, most of us are familiar with CCleaner. CCleaner has been around for a long, 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 long time. And it was originally designed to make it easier to get rid of temporary files, <coughs> which are stored in a location on your computer that a system variable and a user variable points to. And those temporary files can build up over a period of time and start taking up a lot of space. And if you have a mechanical hard drive can, can also cause a lot of defragmented files. So CCleaner would go out and delete those. Then they added on the ability to clear out the cache and various different other settings of browsers. And it made a convenient place, especially if you've got more than one browser, to clear out the cache and the junk from uh, your browsers. And then they expanded it to go through the registry of Windows and find entries that were no longer needed and were left behind when you remove files. Now, in the case of Linux, we don't have an exact parallel, but we do have files and references that build up, especially when you download and install packages or do updates. And sometimes it's not as clean as you'd like it to be. And there are terminal commands, which can in fact clean it up for us. Hang on just a second while I, oops on my other's computer. Okay, so there are terminal commands that we can do to clean up or remove some of the junk. And a shell control for those terminal commands, as well as many others, is in the program bleach bit. So I've already installed it because I know it's going to take a while, but I will show you what I did. Uh, first of all, I searched for bleach bit. And you can see that it, it comes up in a search of the software manager repositories. I selected it. It says delete unnecessary files from the system. Frees up disk space, maintains privacy, removes junk can remove cache because many programs have their own cache files. 
uh, internet history, temporary files, internet cookies, broken shortcuts, uh, programs themselves. So there's a whole bunch of programs that it says that it helps clean up. And if you wish, it'll wipe free disk space. Those of you who are familiar with some of the past partisan kinds of discussions that were going around at the time, know that a very prominent presidential candidate was accused of a number of things that her computer could have shown and provided evidence that might have gone against her. Notice I'm using the feminine pronoun. <laughs> so um, she, and, she retained a company to um, wipe her hard drives. And that was the first time I ever heard the term bleach bit. And I didn't, I didn't pay much attention to what bleach bit was other than I thought it was just a program that, that you know, consultants used. Well, I was very surprised to find that it's open source. John just joined us, so I know he appreciates uh, open source programs. And it was available for all Linux distributions as a package to install. So I did in fact install it and it's on my menu. And I think it's under utilities, but I'll just type in bleach bit. Now, when I, when I bring it up on the menu, you will notice that there's actually two versions that are installed at the same time. There is Bleachbit as the root for cache files and data that you want removed from the entire system in the root account. And this is what we sometimes will do with our commands by typing sudo to have root permission in the terminal. And then there's bleach bit for the user. And this then will clear out cache specifically for the user account. And it's kind of like what Sean was saying earlier when he said that you know he was used to seeing personal kinds of files in one location and system files in another location. So I'm going to start with the user's account and just bring Bleachbit up. And didn't even ask me for a password to get into this, which surprises me. So it's bringing up preferences and asking me what I wish to do. And let's see, it hide irrelevant cleaners. Okay. Confirm before deleting. That's good. And the dark mode, oh, I got, oh, show, show the screen in dark mode. Okay. So, so we are now looking at the bleach bit menu and next to each one of these major areas is a checkbox and it's, it's put into groups. So notice that the first group is APT and we've done uh, a terminal command, uh, sudo apt update and sudo apt upgrade. And we could also do sudo apt auto clean, sudo apt auto remove, sudo apt clean, and sudo apt package lists. And it would go through and execute these for us automatically without us having to type it. So if I do check those four, you can see that now it's telling me this is actually what APT commands will be executed without me having to figure out what the commands do. And it's telling me if I entered the command sudo apt auto clean, it'll go through and check obsolete files that might've been left behind when I updated software. Auto remove will remove obsolete package files for packages that I've downloaded to update. Clean will clean the cache of the computer itself. So there are cache files that are stored away in a cache folder. And package lists, there may be 
packages that I no longer have. Like for example, I just got rid of some programs and if their packages were left behind, this will delete the cache for those packages. Now, if I want to clear any history files that may be in my terminal, I would check this. If I want to clear out, well, I've just gotten rid of Chromium. So I'm just gonna tell it, yeah, even save passwords. So I'm gonna tell it, okay, I've gotten rid of Chrome. I could do this also if Chrome were still installed and I just wanted to clean up privacy information, but I can now go through and anything that might've been left behind with Chrome will be deleted. Hey, Mike. Yep, go ahead. So you, were, you deleted Chrome, uh, Chromium? Yeah. Can you go into uh, I think I, I think I did. No, wait a minute. No, no, I didn't. I'll take it back. No, I, de I deleted uh, Opera and I deleted, um, or I was going to delete. Yeah, no, I did. I kept, I'm sorry, I kept Chromium. My apologies. Okay. Um, but let me see if Opera's on here. No, it's not. Okay, go ahead. You want me to go to Terminal and do something? Yeah, go to Terminal. And uh, type ls space dash la. Return. Now, can you expand? Just double click on the title bar just to expand that window. <clears throat> and there's a config file. See that config folder? So yep. type cd space dot config. Press return ls minus al. So there's your, that's where your settings are stored for your account on this computer. Okay. So if I had an account on this computer, it would re these, these um, settings as I open those files would be stored in my dot config. This is important to know because when you're troubleshooting and you're having some kind of weird problem, and this isn't just what you remove a program, mm -hmm. but if you're using a program and it fails to launch or you're getting some kind of weird uh, response that you don't expect, you can go in and you can just rename one of these full, like for instance, if you had a problem with uh, Chromium, you could uh, rename the Chromium uh, folder, you know, with a command here and just call it dash backup. And then the next time you launch Chromium, it'll create a brand new folder with, with default settings. Okay. I was having some problems doing similar things when I was trying to work with Samba's configuration file. So I'm sure we will talk about that again next time we have our little session. And you're the owner on these these folders and files here. Since it's in your home folder, you're the owner. You don't you shouldn't have to sudo or any of that stuff. The thing with SMB, that's a system wide thing. So you should have to use sudo or become root right. to make changes to those files. Yeah, I was having problems with that. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so since I do have Chrome, um, the last time I used Chrome, I did in fact have cache. I did have cookies from other sites. I have a history that I went to. I have passwords, search engine session, whatever. So I'm just gonna go and say clear it and that'll basically have Chrome clean whatever. Now, you can also do what they call deep scans. And if I go to deep scan, they're widely scattered across the disk. It takes a while to go find them. Uh, there are temporary files. It can set it can take a while because it's gonna look for temporary files everywhere that it considers, including the swap files. So I'm not gonna do that tonight while we're connected, but it's there if I really want to clean it up. Then certain programs, as, as with Chrome, certain other programs, and not every one, but certain other programs will also have their information. So for Firefox, I can do the same kind of clear out that I can do for Chrome. Uh, journal D, I, system journals. So there are system journals in Linux and it'll clear out old system journals, might as well. Uh, LibreOffice, I don't see any need to clear that unless I was concerned about privacy commands. 
And then we have some broken files. So if there are any that were broken, I might want to do it. Um, I can clear out my system clipboard if I wish. I can clean. Go ahead. The, the broken desktop files, does that, that's likely the, uh, if you had removed a program, but it was still that, like, remember you had to manually delete the uh, time, was yep. it uh, team viewer? Yep. I'm thinking that if you had checked that, that would have figured that out and deleted it for you. And we probably could have demonstrated that if I hadn't deleted it myself. Yep. yep. You're right. Uh, I notice it also, it's telling me what the rest of these will do. Uh, you can see if you truly want to hide files, once you quote unquote delete them, they're not really gone. They're still, that data resides in the, um, in the sectors themselves. And recall what I said at the beginning, this was used to literally wipe the free space clean. And you can actually tell it how many times to do it until it's almost impossible to recover just have to ask NSA if they can if they can get it anyway but uh let's see we've got thumbnails we've got some more stuff and we've got debug logs so I'm just going to go ahead for what I've chosen and the first thing I can do is say all right what is it going to delete now that I've made these selections so if you yourself are a little reluctant to run this the first time choose one or more of these that you think you want to clean and then preview what it's going to do. So if we take a look at this, I'm looking on my other screen. All right, let me go up here to the top. So there's a lot of stuff on here that it's going to delete because I've got so many things chosen. So I'll tell you what, instead of doing everything, let me go back. Let's see if I can tell this to go back, abort. Okay, I just wanna go back over here again. All right, fine. So I'm gonna uncheck everything. I'll uncheck these. Okay, so let's just look at, at what I said I wanted to do was clean Chrome. Now this may give me a really long list again yeah well it looks like let's see how much i've got this space to be recovered 3.4 megabytes 163 files and 21 special operations so you can see this is what it's going to delete and it's similar to what c cleaner would clean if you told it to clean chrome's cache in windows so i'm just say go ahead and clean Am I sure? Yes, I am. Delete. Okay, that was pretty fast. Now, remember I said that this is doing what the terminal could do. So let's just take a look at, if I say apt auto remove. Okay, so I'm just, that's just a single clean pack. Let's see what that wants to delete. Okay, that's pretty, it's saying there's only one operation that'll, that it will clean. So just for kicks, let's actually go into the terminal and let's do that. And indeed it did. It removed one and or it's going to remove one and it's going to free up uh, 60.4 kilobytes yes okay now let's see what happens if i run this as root so i'm going to go back in again Let me try, make sure I did the right password. 
Yeah. Okay. And probably the fact that I use sudo apt auto remove, there's probably nothing to do at this point. Yep, there still is. Okay. So at, at root level, there's still a special operation to do. Well, whatever's okay. I guess it's just counting the operation. Now I didn't do clean at root level. So let's take that one out. Let's see if clean winds up giving me anything it's going to do. No, nope, there's nothing there for it to do either. All right, let's look at root level backup files. And let's see what it's nope, nothing to get nothing to do there. Let's look at root level temporary files. So I got a pretty clean computer. Let's see if I've got any journal files to do. This computer hardly ever gets used. How about broken desktop files? Nope. Okay, so it doesn't look like, let's see, how about temporary files here? No, okay. Looks like I got a nice clean computer at the root level. But to do a thorough clean, if that's what you wish to do, uh, you would run BleachBit both as the user and then you would run it as root in order to clean your system up. And if you truly wanted to wipe a drive, Let's say you had a hard drive with Linux on it, a mechanical hard drive, and you were going to replace it with an SSD, and then you were just going to get rid of the mechanical hard drive without getting out a sledgehammer or something to hit it, or maybe you give it to somebody else to use for another computer. You could run bleach bit on it and just tell it to wipe the surface of the hard drive, and you would do that from the root level. Questions on bleach bit? How did, Mike? You, how did you yeah. find it? How did I find it? Yeah. Um, I think I searched on how to remove temporary files in Linux and BleachBit was one of the ones that came up. And then I realized that oh. it, it was available from the store just by searching for it. Thanks for sharing. And Mike, when you did the root part, you didn't have to go to terminal, right? No, you I just, just I no. just did that. You just show showed you. us how you could do it if we went to terminal. Correct. That's all you were doing is demonstrating that. All right, thank you. The thing to to keep in mind is BleachBit may have some of its own additional code. I'm sure it does, but in essence, it's a shell around the maintenance commands. Every action that it's doing could be done from the terminal by you researching the necessary commands and then typing them in. So here you've got this nice shell and you just check the boxes and say, this is what I'd like to clean up. Okay. All right, let me stop sharing. And look at my bleach bit. Okay, so next is my icon of the month. <laughs> and stop sharing. Okay, I see John Spitz has joined us. Welcome, John. So this will be our discussion slash round robin, whatever. I've been talking now for a good 45 minutes. Time flies when you're having fun. So, uh, Bud, I know you told me that you've done something here the last uh, couple of days. Why don't you tell us what you've been doing with Linux? Um, I actually uh, 
got bored the other day and I installed um, virtual um, desktop or whatever that actually thing is called. Virtual, virtual machine. Yeah. And uh, I stuck Zorin on it. And I've been kind of playing with it a little bit over the last day or so. And it's actually kind of a nice little distro, um, which I'm sure Mike is going to get into in a bit here. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And the other thing I did while I had uh, nothing better to do, I also threw Windows 11 into that and playing around with Windows 11. So far, I haven't been convinced that it's anything you need to install. And actually, for the longer, the longer I've been playing with it, um, the easier it is to decide not to install it. So that's just, uh, you know, we're playing around with it for a few hours. Now, have you installed VirtualBox before, or was this the first time? It was the first you? time I ever installed it. How hard did you find it was to set it up? Uh, not hard at all, actually. I set it up uh, with Windows 11 first, and uh, I was following a set of instructions on how to install Windows 11 on VirtualBox, and I ran into all kinds of problems with it, and I dragged my son up here, who's used it before, and he found a couple of clicks to click and buttons to push and that kind of stuff, and it worked. But the interesting thing about it was while... Windows 11 was installing, every time Windows 11 needed to reboot, it froze VirtualBox. I had to shut down VirtualBox and restart it again. And then the Windows install would pick up where it stopped. So it did happen about four times during the install. But when I got done, it installed. Now, when I did the uh, Zorin, it just installed, bang, just like that. And no problems, no, no, just worked real well. Now, that's something I want to investigate. And uh, Judy Latour has a, a friend or associate who has agreed to talk to us if we can uh, get him scheduled uh, about that specifically. So I'm looking forward to doing something like that in, in a future meeting. Or yeah, I did it, like I said, I did it blind and kind of got my way through it. I'll let you do the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sean, have you got some input for tonight? Um, yeah, I uh, have this new Synology uh, disk station, and my goal is to create, um, it has a, ver you can install a free virtual machine manager, and my goal is to uh, install some various versions of Linux on that and then just experiment with through a web browser to interface with the uh, with the virtual machine so I can have Linux and Ubuntu and, and Pop OS and so forth and uh, be able to easily compare them and not have to tie up a machine. Um, so that's so, using the memory that comes with the Synology or that you upgrade and then some of the hard drive space that that's mm -hmm. normally set aside for storage to actually be the the storage for the where the virtual machine is located. That's right. Yeah. Uh, or I could plug in. Of course, I could plug in a USB drive if I wanted to, like a solid state drive, and have that. Um, you know, because it's got the USB ports on it. Um, so that's down the road a little bit. I've got some things going on this month that kind of tying me up. But uh, and I have this Pop OS on my MacBook Pro. Uh, I have an older MacBook Pro that I. I'm kind of kind of decommissioned in, in place. I used a I now use a uh, MacBook Air for my Mac OS, and Pop OS is a really nice polished system. I really like it. It's by System76, and System76 sells computers that come with Pop OS installed, uh, but they also open up the operating system to uh, as it's open source, of course, so you can install it on other things. So I've been really happy with it. What's the, John, going uh, back to Synology, uh, Synology is actually going to have a uh, seminar here um, on, when is it? It's uh, September 30th, and they're going to be talking about what you can do with the NAS device and what a NAS device is and uh, why choose NAS to store and manage data, how to choose one and how to set it up. Great. Um, where it's going to be uh, it's, it's where going to be on the uh, September 30th and I think you probably if you went out to the Synology website um, you can probably sign up for it 
um, I, I signed up for it. So. Um, okay. All right. I'll look that up. Thank you, bud. Appreciate it. Me mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think that's it for me. Um, are you still interested in having a Synology SIG, Mike? Been thinking about it. Uh, my my attention has been divided among many things here lately, as I'm sure yours yeah. has too. So um, right now in Orlando, there's three of us that I'm aware of that, that I have contacts, or three including me. And um, one of my lunch bunch buddies has, oh, I found out the other day as a Synology. And I might be able to find others in the local area, or I might be able to find others just would like to do so on a national level. Right. Um, but there are still still many, many things that I haven't been able to make work, which even with the YouTube, there's phenomenal YouTube videos. But just as it is, it's time management enters into this. Right. To be able to sit down and watch a two-hour Synology video end to end, and then go back and then say, okay, I got to do these steps. Is it working? Okay, why isn't it working? That's when I send you an email and say, hey, I tried this yeah, and, it, right. and it didn't work. <laughs> what do I have to do? So there's a few right. of those building up on my list. Though so it's not like put it in, turn it on and make it run. And the whole concept really of, of doing this SIG was install it, turn it on, make it run, let it be a simple system that you can then use for your computer and make it your, your computer, you know, instead of Windows or, or Mac and, and, um, and use it on an everyday basis. So that's my goal eventually. And eventually mm -hmm. we might, might not need this SIG, but the, the key is, is let's, you know, we'll review the topics that, that, that you all are interested in and, and uh, giving me feedback helps. And at the end of this um, presentation, we'll, we'll also talk about the way ahead. Okay. Um, that reminds, um, that, one more ahead. thing. Um, I have started using a, a, a mail program called Geary. Um, I'm not super crazy about it. Is there any mail programs that you're all using that you like uh, to access your like IMAP mail? Donna, what, what was the one that we played around with for you that you were using on Windows and you were going to install on Linux? Okay, I, well, I put Proton on both, but um, about the Valdi, that because it also has an email client and it's very private. And I but decided you, that because that? it has its own email client, I was interested because I've been reading all my email on the web. And I would like not to have to read it all on the web. I'm tired of having to click each one to read it, I guess is what I want to say. So that's why I was looking at it. But then I, I hesitated because I didn't know which version to download for sure. But it sounded it was highly recommended. And I thought, well, that might be since it's all inclusive. That's how SeaMonkey worked. And that's Absolutely. how I'm used to. Uh, Netscape way back when working that I had a browser and I had an email client I could just click and get them all open and then eventually get to read them so that's what I'm missing with Thunderbird you know as soon as I click something it moves me right to that page and it's very jolting because I want to get through the email so I didn't like Thunderbird for that reason so I'm ready to look at this my validity well, well you have all that you had asked about Sea Monkey when we first started, right? And I did some research and found that Sea Monkey could be installed on Mint. Um, it took a while, and and it, it's it's not a straightforward installation. You've got some terminal commands to make it work, and then I didn't have a mail host that I could interrogate for email to check check it out. So you might still look at that and find that if mint is a good baseline for you sea monkey might work very well for you on mint if you can make it work donna what was the name of the can you spell the name of the the program you were just saying i, I couldn't understand uh, it's like the music the four seasons by 
I'm just not saying it right. Vivaldi. Huh? Vivaldi. Vivaldi. Yeah. Anyway. It's a, it's a browser. Oh, it's a web it's a browser, not a not a client. Correct. It, oh, okay. It's the the new new uh, grandson of uh, Opera. Okay. Oh. So the guy who did Opera didn't like what the people that did it, so he took the recipe back and the play on Opera with Vivaldi, who wrote operas. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but reincarnation. So Donna, then based on your discussion at the very beginning of this thing, it's not a distribution of Linux. You just found that Vivaldi is available on a couple right. of distributions. Well, you ought to be able to, I haven't searched for it, but you ought to be able to search for Vivaldi and see if you can install it on Mint. No, no problem I, with that. It, you know, it's, you know, based on Chromium, so it's going to go, it's going to install. Okay. So use well, the, sof they, use they the software different... manager or look for it. Now, if I find it, I'll... I did. Opera. It's not there it, it, in the it, software it manager. It's not there. I searched for it on the internet and downloaded it from there. I just didn't install it because I wasn't too sure what, between choosing the Debian or the Ubuntu. And I just kind of waited. Ah, so I thought, <clears throat> okay. It, it doesn't really they... matter because Mint comes from Ubuntu and Ubuntu comes from Debian. They're the same right. thing. It's a Deb package that you want. So. Okay. That's the one you, you you want to use that. Perfect. Donna, what was it that you said caused you the problem in Thunderbird? When I would click on a link, it would change the setting I, and I would immediately go to that web page. And I was used to reading email, like even in Gmail, where you click on a link, I just open and I can continue getting through that email and start deleting things. So I didn't like what Thunderbird did was immediately moving me from the email to that link I clicked on. And well, if I clicked, would you, I guess, you know, the question, why are you clicking on the link, if not just reading the email? Well, it's something I want to read later and I want to get through the email. I have, oh, I have a want, number of emails. I want to be able to click them all off, you know, and then the ones that I've opened the links that I want to explore with more time those links are open and I've gotten through the email, I've cut everything up. Now I wanna go read the links that I selected. Did, I don't wanna be interrupted in the reading the, what email has come in. I wanna get through that process. So that's just my, yeah. my well, habit. You know, do you do a right click and just say open in your browser? And I say, would... no. oh, I, yeah, I, I would click the link and then it would just switch. Well. And I think I right clicked also, because I I'm used to that in all the other programs. Right clicking open, you know, and it always opens in a new tab. So I don't know why I, it didn't in Thunderbird. Go, have you have you gone through the uh, settings for Thunderbird? No, I I yeah. just and I couldn't find. I had trouble with the address book. There were a number of things. So yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not doing POP3 email at the moment. I'm going to the internet and just, when we traveled, I needed POP3 where I could quickly connect, download and get off the internet because you had to pay for a lot of places to even use the internet. So I use POP3. It's not necessary for my email to use POP3. So I can just go read it on the internet and it's no problem. Well, IMAP works that way too. It downloads and then you can just connect from it. The nice thing about IMAP is when you hook back up again, it'll mark on the server what you've read and what you haven't, and it'll delete things that you've deleted and whatnot. Pop3 downloads everything to your to your client. Yeah, right. But I like that when I was traveling. That's not a, but usually, it's by default, it's not available on the server anymore. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was always available again with Comcast on the server it was okay. always there john so, have you have you done an apcug workshop on mail clients john kennedy oh you're making me think back over a year's worth of stuff <laughs> <laughs> if not <laughs> I, if not i think we're hearing that's something else to add to well, your list the, the, okay but the what i can tell you is that um the reason there are not that many 
you know, clients out there is because the mass majority are all doing webmail. And that's why, you know, the number one Linux email client is Thunderbird. Yeah. It sounds know, like a, a combination of, of settings and yeah. then um, the use of the preview pane as opposed to not using the preview pane and clicking on each individual email list or link as Donna calls it. So it may well be that there's a configuration that could put Thunderbird in the format that she would like to read and, and give her the results she wants. But Donna, when you said that Vivaldi, you thought had a mail client that would work for you the way you want it to, since Vivaldi is in fact a web browser, then it must have a unique way of accessing your web mail and presenting it to you that's different than the way the other browsers would. That's what it sounds Perhaps. like. Perhaps, I don't know. It also, it had a, a, a VPN. It just had a number of things that, that sounded really good. And because Opera was bought by the Chinese, I didn't want to deal with Opera. So I thought it's worth exploring. As I said, I'm using Brave, but here's what's happened. On a couple of the websites, when I was signing up for something and I had to go with continue with Brave, it didn't work. So I would have to then open Firefox and go through the same thing and everything worked with Firefox. So there's some things with Brave that doesn't work on everything. And I, I discovered that while using Brave. And I, all I can think of it, the times it doesn't work is when I'm registering for something and I have to, you know, I'll put in my name and my address and da da da, and there's a continue or something or or sign up, and Brave just sits there. It doesn't work. So then I just say, okay, I know it's not going to work. It didn't, and I, you know, try it a couple of times. So then I just open another browser, and go through the process, and it works. Firefox works. So I don't know what the deal is with Brave. It's in the settings. Security. It, and it's in the settings. I've had that well, happen too. And I've had to change some of the settings in Brave. The post office, okay. the US postal system, you get your, if, for those that print labels at home and you go through the whole process in Brave and you get to the point where you're supposed to pay and it just sits there and doesn't do anything. And I, I, right. I had to go through some of the security settings in Brave and change them and then it worked. So. They're, all the browsers have configuration problems like that that you need to do. All right. Well, anyway, I thought it was worth looking at this other one. Okay. And then I explained about the document, but I want to ask since John's here too, does Clip It, it it's just taking a little sequence of something and putting it in like, in a, like a clipboard. But if I want to screen capture, is there a program in Linux? And if I wanted to scroll for more than one, one page, if I wanted to cap, to screen capture <laughs> two pages, is it two different screenshots or could I do it all in one? And I don't know what the Linux program is for that. And I've taken up enough time, so no, I'm yeah. done. No, those are good. Um, I'm, oh. using, I'm using Clip It on, I'm pretty sure on this uh, computer. Hang on a second, let me see. Yeah, I am. So let me let me just share my screen and bring it up. And there's our famous black bars there, John. But why can't you put I... it back? We got rid of it. I know, I know, I know. Okay, let's see. Can you guys see my mouse down here at the bottom of the screen, or is it? Yes. Okay. All right. So here is Clip It. And you can see that these are places that I've been to before. And so I can go ahead and go, you know, if I select this, then paste it into web browser, whatever. It just, and, and based on the history that's in there and my preferences, I can choose how many to have and so on. And so this is good for text kinds of things. It will, it will also clip a JPEG, 
but it's not good for JPEGs. Now, I have put screenshot on here and you can see I can grab the whole screen. I can grab the current window. I can grab an area, but if I'm in a web browser that's got more than one page, I'm gonna to have to do it a page at a time. So if I say, select an area and I say, I'm just interested in, well, I didn't, I may do it again because I let go too soon. Let's say I wanna get this column. Okay, so I've now captured that particular section and I can save it and then I can go to my pictures. And there's what I just captured. Now, if I wanted to scroll, unfortunately, with a screenshot, no, I can't go further than the you know, the, the length of what I was able to capture on the screen. So I'd have to do multiple ones. And you can see I've got a bunch of stuff on here. Uh, I have no idea what that was. Okay, I got, a, I got a, a shot of my terminal with some commands in it that I was going through. But you can see I can't scroll that. I have to I have to capture each thing individually. Well, Mike, that comes with that's that comes with Linux Mint, right? That's, the screen. Yes. Yeah, um, I thought. Yeah, screenshot comes with okay. Mint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. John, are you aware of anything that can capture? Other than doing a video, I mean, a screen capture yeah. video where you're scrolling your screen down. I don't know of any way to get more than just one screen at a time. Yeah, I'm trying to trying to look back up. I have very little need for that. But there is, I'm pretty sure there is something. I, when I was doing the thing on my free stuff, and I right now can't remember, KSNP is the other one that I'm using along with um, uh, it's not green green shots the one on the windows um uh, shutter is another one it's, it's it's an older one that came back out um you want to, How about, uh, but, uh, what's the what's the end goal I, I understand doing a full screen capture of a web page but is it just to read it offline or or what's the no, reason it, okay i was in a, a sous vide cooking class and the temperatures change if you're cooking pork in the water bath or chicken. And the list, because I didn't want to spend $30 for their list, I wanted to copy the screens and not do it page by page by page. So that was one of the reasons where I wanted to be the ability to scroll. So you so, could try um, doing a print and then save it as a PDF? Well, that's what I ended up doing. I made a PDF and then because it, it anyway, I just what I ended up doing was making a PDF and printing it and put it in my cookbook. So, but I mean, that's why I just wondered if I wanted, you know, if it was three pages or something, it would have been nice to just get the documentation. But that, instead, uh, I did the PDF. Okay. There did, is, are there pictures and stuff too, or is it just text? No, there weren't pictures. There, there's a there's a program I used more than 10 years ago when I was doing web management and it would actually capture a website. Um, it was all done with commands. Um, and if, if you put in a, a web address and then you ran the program, it would literally go through, pull up the HTML coding, capture the whole thing and archive it, and then you would bring up your own, just in any web viewer, any, you know, any, any client, you would open that up. And now you've got on your computer, their website, 
and you can scroll through everything, but it's been so long since I've done that, that I, I can't even remember what, it, what program it was that I used to do that. But haven't you ever been to a page where they won't let you write a PDF from it? Yeah, I just I've do been to I just, some of those. Yeah, I just so do. I, then I try this, you know, the snipping tool out of Windows, which would be your clip it. Yeah. But I was thinking sometimes you can't, you know, you, you can't duplicate it. And I wanted that information. So I was working a number of ways to try to get it. And that's anyway, it's okay. I, I, <laughs> yeah, the best way to, for me is just to, you know, save, save the web page as an HTML. And it saves it as a whole HTML file that you can read. Um, you don't have to mess around with trying to, you know, screen capture. Just save it as an HTML file and then open it up whenever you want to. I understand what you're saying, but I wanted these recipes at my fingertips. I wanted to know the temperatures and the length of hours. And well, what's, what's, what's the difference between having a, a file that you can open up and a screenshot that you can open up because when i'm cooking in the kitchen i may not have a computer next to me to tell me all this so i gotta run downstairs to my office don't worry you guys don't worry about it I, I <laughs> no, took no, no, care. No. Well, yeah but we we needed to know what you wanted to do yeah. and if you want to print it out that's important to know yeah. Yeah. i needed to get it printed so that's oh, why oh, i oh, asked okay, about okay. if there was that's a the scrolling you, you save it as as an html file and you can print it out yeah you know, you can print web pages out with no problem. All right, I'll try that. I always try to do the PDF to make it smaller. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, the easier way, just save the file and, you know, as an HTML, then, then just print that out. All right, perfect. Try that out. Also, okay. Keep in mind also that a lot of these, a lot of times on those websites where they have recipes, there's a link, a button somewhere, you have to kind of look for it, but it'll say, make it uh, print, print. printable, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and that makes it print nice instead of trying to print a web page because sometimes that looks, that's not formatted well for, the web pages aren't always formatted well for printing. Um, I was also thinking about, I use Firefox and Firefox has, when you go to a website in the address field over to the right, there's a little, it looks like a document and if you click on that, it reformats the web page, takes all the takes all the junk off. Often there's advertisements and so forth. Takes that off of there and makes it a readable document with nice big clear text. And that might be an option too to get it in that state and then try printing it, and then it'd be easy to read while you're sitting there cooking. And this right. is something that uh, that Huey has covered um, in a, a number of his uh, presentations. In fact. Many times in Tech for Senior, he wants to to show something from the web, and he'll he'll click on this extension, and the extension gets rid of all the junk, gets rid of all the advertisement, and just that's, shows that's it. print friendly. That's it, print friendly. That's Thank it. print you. friendly, yeah. and that's an extension, and it really does a nice job. It's been around for ages. So Donna, also, look up. Right. Look I have up. a lot. Yep. Look up uh, print friendly Donna, for your browser. I will. Yeah. Now I'm looking at, at the uh, program I used to use a long time ago, then kind of wasn't developed now is it's called shutter. And in one of the reviews, it says that um, you can capture entire display or even a website using this simple application. And I used to use Shutter a lot until it kind of didn't go develop much. So Shutter was one that says it'll do a whole website. Okay. okay. And that's Shutter, S H U T T E R. Correct. And it's and and the one that you're talking about is a Linux program. Yeah. Or is it Linux? Is it, it multi-platform? I think it's mostly Linux on this one. Okay. Because there's right. some good ones in, in on that side, but yeah, um, but there's a number of good um, <laughs> ones. Even um, it's not it, it doesn't do what she wants with the whole page, but it's called Scrot. 
which is a web-based one, I mean, a command line and a graphical one. Uh, yeah. That's plenty of ideas, gentlemen. Go on to the next person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, John, I could ask you, what have you been doing lately? But I know what you did today. By the way, yeah, that was an I excellent have, workshop. <laughs> I haven't been doing much with the... Uh, um, anything fancy with Linux because um, helping Bill try to figure out some of these different things. Our club, we, we've just, we've gone through and uh, once we got back into our classroom, we, um, uh, find, get back, there we go, uh, got back in and, you know, we haven't been in the building for over a year and we were using an uh, Ubuntu long term, which went out like a year ago, because we didn't do I think we were still using uh, 1604 maybe. And so it went out. So we decided that we, we were moving to uh, Mint Mate and installed that and ran into an interesting problem. We did it off of either thumb drive or I had some uh, DVDs made uh, and running it on the DVD or the thumb drive, you know, saw the mint fine, installed it. Then when we rebooted, our graphics was a stair step. And we had to go through and find out that it was probably the uh, window composing thing. And we had to find do a trick in which we had to download the mint uh, Mate tweaks, and then try to be able to get to it because with your um, display in stair steps, the the uh, button that you wanted to click that was down the bottom right was not real. It was just the display. We had to come from the left side and kind of go straight down to where it would be if it wasn't the stair steps, and got it fixed and then found out that every time we, we then uh, created a personal user for our group and same thing happened. So there's a problem with uh, the computer that we have that has a graphic issue. So we got that all straightened around. Then we went through and we put uh, uh, specific IP addresses on each computer so that we can learn to do our SSHing into it and updating and copy, secure copy, which is where we are right now with getting that all set up. Uh, at home, I just use my computers. Um, you know, a little bit of a window when we had to use it for some of the things we did for the, the workshop. Um, I'm not doing anything with the Pi group because I'm, I'm, I just have a Pi in a box. Um, but in, in two weeks, we'll be doing for the Wednesday workshop uh, virtual box in which we'll install virtual box on both the Windows computer because since most beginner or new people interested in, in uh, Linux are coming from Windows. So we'll show them about installing virtual box on the Windows and then virtual box on Linux. And then we'll use virtual box to install probably uh, Mint Mate since that's what I like. Uh, to show them how to do a, an install of Linux using VirtualBox. So Good. that's the one we're building up for. That's something that, you know, Bud had said earlier that, that, that he worked on. And I tried it as a novice. And there were so many settings, I wasn't sure what to choose and how to do it. And stick, I knew I was going to default. I was going to need an just, instructional video of some sort. So, yeah. Good. We, we recommend just stick with the default. You know, I don't change anything other than on, on the default. I, you know, I change the size of the, the uh, virtual machine that I want. But as to the settings, we all just leave it as is. Um, I think Bud's problem more was trying to install Windows 11 in a virtual machine, not, you know, virtual box. No, the virtual box install wasn't bad at all. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And uh, it was just uh, when I saw 11, every time I wanted to reboot, it kind of froze the whole thing. Had to yeah. shut it down and restart it, and then it continued. Yeah, and, and there are some uh, Linux that do the same thing with the virtual box. 
that when you uh, shut down it in a virtual uh, situation, it doesn't shut down. Uh, a lot of times you know, you'll get a message that says, you know, take out the CD and then hit enter or take out the medium and you hit that and it just sits there. So yeah, the, it's just, uh, you know, a live quirk. The scary one for me this morning when, or yesterday when I was doing that um, was when it got to the point where it's um, creating the hard drive and all of a sudden it's going to reformat. <laughs> this is now what am I reformatting? <laughs> it doesn't yeah. really tell you. Right. You, but just I have said, to be, you just have to be good that you remember the exact size of the virtual machine mm -hmm. that you made and that it's going to reformat a, a, a I was very button. scientific about it. I closed my eyes and I clicked the button. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, when I opened it up, everything was working. So Good. Yeah. Window, Windows uh, is, is an interesting bird. We used to dual boot Windows on our teaching computers, starting back with XP and then into 7 and you know then to 10. And we found out that that seven and ten, not in virtual, but on on two partitions, uh, couldn't coexist very well because yeah. Windows ten wanted to be in charge, and we lost access to hard drives and stuff because Windows ten runs a different way. So we were glad when we finally said to everybody, um, no more dual booting on windows now we got I, I used to have swappable hard drives and i'd swap the linux yeah. one and put in the windows one so, yeah we ended up in in our situation where our uh computers have two hard drives but our windows guys because they didn't like linux being able to get into uh windows uh rewired the the motherboard so that we have an ab switch that directs the power to Windows one way and Linux the other way. So uh, they don't even coexist that way. Yeah. All righty. Um, Stu, what you, have you been doing over the last month with Linux? Not a whole bunch. I, I'm up to date with uh, Mint Mate. Uh, and uh, I still have, uh, John, I still have my Raspberry Pi sitting here. I've done nothing with in the last six months, uh, but uh, I have looked at uh, some YouTube videos. There's a there's a Linux distribution called Twister, and uh, you can actually install it on top of um, uh, Linux Mint or uh, or Ubuntu in the uh, in the, uh, it's not in the Mate version. That's that. That what's a stripped down version of Mint? Uh, 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 XFCE. Yeah, XFCE. Right. You uh, you can put Twister on top of it. It emulates a Windows machine and a Mac computer. In fact, their graphics were so good that they got letters from Apple and Microsoft telling them to uh, cease and desist. And uh, so they, they, they had actually stolen the graphics from uh, Apple and Microsoft. So they came up with their own graphics, but you can't tell them apart, but I guess now they aren't copyright, you know, yeah. uh, infringement. Zarn but, uh, probably has gotten letters like that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, now, I would believe so. That one that's, that's, that's an exact copy that came out a while ago, uh, something x something that was everything copied yeah. from windows right. i don't know how it's still but there was a, there's a distribution that looks identical to windows 10 yeah well at any rate twister was one i wanted windows to fx that's it thanks bud yeah that's it i i wanted to try twister just because uh i thought it would be nice uh and uh it installs some of the you on a Pi, uh, it will not run uh, Zoom and some other clients unless you load up some middleware on top of it that sits between the Linux and, and your uh, and your what you're trying to run, and uh, uh, and uh, there is some middleware that they 
that Twister puts on there automatically that you don't have to go out and configure it. So that would be nice. Um, but I haven't done anything on it. I, 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 do, uh, I do weekly SIGs here for our Tampa club. And uh, I do one on Chromebook, one on, uh, one on uh, uh, Google add-ons, uh, uh, the freebie stuff where they can track you. And, um, uh, and I do uh, two on cutting the cable. So uh, I, I'm pretty busy doing those. Okay. But, but I enjoy, uh, I'll tell you, Mike, I enjoy this group. Uh, it, it's probably the best group I, I'm in because I learn something every time I come here. And uh, this is just as good as uh, APCUG uh, Wednesday afternoon groups. <laughs> Well, we, we, Mike, we, you said. we struggle to find our way around. Yes, John. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I was saying, you know, you said, well, we might ne not need this SIG again for you guys. I'm just here to help make it go because right. I'm a Linux person. But our Linux SIG group, we've, we've been going on for, you know, um, 10 years or so. And we're always learning something yeah. know, yes. new and, and stuff. So. Right. Uh, well, I like the fact that Sean suggested last time that we do just what we're doing now. You know, go around, let everybody ask questions, talk about, you know, what they, they're concerned about, try to see if we can find answers and, and do some problem solving. And, and it looks yeah. like it's very productive to do that. Mm -hmm. I always ask our group, because we meet on Friday, um, twice, a, you know, second, fourth Fridays, you know, what do you want to talk about? Tell me so I can add it to the agenda. And I rarely get anything back, but you know, people come to the meeting. Um, John comes, John S comes, and we've been having fun uh, trying to do a hybrid meeting with Jitsi. Oh. And you know, you'd appreciate the fact that things were going pretty good. And then we kicked out into the console, and then you lose uh, Zoom because Zoom only runs in graphical and so they couldn't see anything so um <clears throat> then when we tried to restart something but i came with a solution last time and it wasn't too bad i bring in a camera and put it on a monitor and shine it on the, uh, on the screen screen yeah and so if he goes to terminal or the console not terminal console then you could still see it but we have to still work we have some reflection problems and stuff like that um, but yeah, we end up having discussions and talk about things. I think I have one person that sent me back something uh, that really wasn't a Linux thing. Oh, yeah, it was uh, trying to convert uh, a video file into something that Apple can read. You know, what do we have in Linux that could convert it so that Apple can read it? I'm not an Apple person, so I don't know uh, what kind of video files they read whether they can't read an mp4 uh, but i said you know the solution is that you find out what file it can read we have a, a program in linux that can convert files and so right. convert it and go with it mm -hmm. uh, so you know we, we we've been going around for you know 10 years we started we started out with one computer at our repair place and we would get together we would all hover around it and install ubuntu and then six months later we'd all hover around and install the next one and then six months later and then we got a couple of computers then some people brought laptops and now we're fortunate that we have a lab with 12 computers and uh so we can have we have some you know some people bring their own laptops and use it but it's nice to be able to be on the network and access our server and yes hopefully we'll go longer well well i have to admit that one of the fringe benefits of the pandemic if there are is such a thing is that the online community has significantly grown has mushroomed and we're doing things online that that we you know never had done before we were forced to and the expansion, mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious, you know, just in, in the mix of people that are on today on a local SIG, otherwise it would probably be Sean and me 
uh, maybe stew, you know, and that would be it. So uh, at least it's, and, and this will be recorded and it's, it's available as well. Yeah. All right. Well, let me press on with Zorn and then any other discussion afterwards. I will. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I want to see this, Mike. Okay. So we'll, we will share again. Okay, so let's let this little black bar go away. Go away, go away, go away. It'll go away. It's not, it's not visible on my- We don't see it. You, you don't, don't see it, so that's good. No. Okay. Yeah, so what did you do different this time? Because the, the little black box from the top isn't there this time that I can see. Well, I said hide video panel here. I'm on the Windows computer at the moment. And and I've got my control panel up there, even though I said I said shy, and I did uh, I did the uh, control backslash, which is supposed to anyway. All right, I'm not going to worry about it. It's it's there. So you are looking at two screens that are captured from the Zorn website, and obviously they're trying to make this look like Max or or something because I see the mouse there and the the keyboard. But what you're looking at is Zorn in their screens and both of their screens. And here you've got Zorn in a Windows 10 like setup. And here you've got Zorn in sort of a Mac Lite or Windows 11 setup. So what I want to do is essentially show you very quickly how I installed it instead of recording a video or taking you through a painful half hour installation. So I've got some screen captures that I will show you. I'll take you very quickly to the Zorn website itself. Uh, I will show you a review that's available. And I had an email just before we started with another one. I will show you a site that has about a 30 minute walkthrough, installation setup, configuration programs, and even running, installing and running some Windows programs. And then very quickly, just give you a, a live demo. So I'm looking probably at 20 minutes for, the, for this whole thing. So the very first thing I'll show you when I bring up my Picasa, uh, there we go. Okay, so what we are looking at here is some screen captures that I did with my, or not screen captures, some, some pictures that I did with my cell phone. And what I'm doing essentially is I made a distro uh, of Zorin and I put it on um, mind blank. Hang on a second. On Ventoy. Okay, so I put it on Ventoy on a Samsung flash drive. And the very nice thing about our Lenovo, I think I mentioned it once before, it has two power buttons. And if I press a tiny little button that's next to the main button, I can select the boot manager and I don't have to go through the painful process of figuring out which function key do I press to get it. So I chose the, the, the drive that Ventoy was installed. There's the Ventoy menu with the ISOs that are in there. And I do thank John for his excellent coverage of Ventoy in one of the um, Wednesday workshops. And you can see that Zarin's distro is here, which I chose. This is the screen that comes up when you boot. And the very first time I did it, I did choose try and I played with it probably for a half hour, just going through the menus and seeing what was there. And I said, yeah, okay, that's fine. Now let's install it. Well, the installation process is very similar to Mint and a lot of others. I do have a very, I do really like the fact that in the installation, it finds the Wi-Fi right off the bat, so I don't have to install it later. Um, it allows you to download updates while installing. So as you're going out, now that you're connected to the internet, it will go out and get updates. And I did also choose the third-party software for graphics and, and hardware support. And they do want to kind of monitor your use. So I said, I, I didn't check this only because I said, well, if it helps them know that there's another Zorin computer on the network, that they're just going to count it. But I think if I were going to permanently put it on a computer I was going to use myself, I might 
I might check that button. I don't know. But anyway, I, I let them see that. Uh, now, this is installed on the same Linux computer we were looking at earlier that only originally had Linux Mint 20 on it. So it's saying, right, it recognized it. It said, yep, you've got Linux Mint 20 on here. What do you want to do? You can erase it and do a full install, which I didn't want to do. But you can install it alongside Linux Mint. And it says that it'll keep the documents and personal files and all the rest of that, and then choose the operating system uh, from Grub each time the computer starts up. Separate issue, which I'll talk about later. And so the only other thing is that it then originally told me that this, it's hard to see the print here and the screen capture, but this is the Linux Mint partition and it was out here somewhere on the hard drive. So <clears throat> it, it let me just grab a hold of a slider and adjust this so Zarn was using half of the, of the drive. So I just slid it over and said, okay, 50, 50, let's, you know, let's, let's go that route. So we did the changes, asked me if I want to write it, said it's going to be formatted, and voila, it did so. So let me close this. And let me close that. And let's take a quick look at the Zorn website. So I am going to come out. Let's see, I think I can just tab it. And uh, let me go to, and just take me a moment to find the right tab here. There we go. Okay. So this is the Zarn website. And I still would like to get my video panel to go up. So hang on a moment while I tell it to hide it again. No. Hide floating meeting controls. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, I hid the meeting controls. Now I can see it. <clears throat> All right, so this is zarn.com OS. You can go to zarn.com, but you want the one that, that the, when you click on it, it, it goes through and it tells you the new release, which is 16. It's got a link to immediately download it if you wish. Get some reviews shows you that you can have all kinds of desktops configured, Windows, Mac, or OS, or Linux. They claim more speed. Um, it is fast. I have not tried it on a computer with limited resources, no more so than the one for the Computer Society. Uh, they do have a light version, which is, uh, says it will work on computers as old as 15 years. So I got a couple of those sitting on a shelf. So I may just try that just for the kicks to see. Says it's reliable. It's based on Ubuntu. Um, resistant to, you know, all the standard things you hear about security, privacy, no personal data at all collected other than if you allow them to say, yep, there's another one online. And the nice thing is that there are many apps from many different software repositories that you don't have to go and get the repositories, they're there. Uh, Flathub is there, Snap is there, uh, the Debian repositories are there, they're all there in the software store. Uh, you are supposed to be able to run different gaming systems on top of their operating system. So that includes Steam, Lutris that I'm not familiar were, with, and your software store has got many itself. Uh, Steam, there's a game I've played, played for many, many, many years, Elder Scrolls Skyrim. And it's either on my PS3 or it's on Windows. I haven't played it probably in three years now. But it will be interesting to see if I load the overlay for Steam to see whether it'll actually run on a Linux machine, because I didn't think it, it would. Um, it has the capability to link your phone like Windows 10 does and get notifications between them. 
Uh, and as, as I just showed you, you can put it alongside Windows, Mac, or other Linux applications or in distros. Uh, it says it's compatible with all the documents. Make it better. Questions, et cetera. Okay, so the first article is on uh, FOSS. It's FOSS and it's top nine features in the newly released Zarn. I took a look at some of them. Some of them are just kinds of things like um, if you shake a screen around and you turn jelly mode on, it, the whole screen will sort of wobble. I mean, so what? But it, it does. It's, it's there if, if you want to do that. Um, you can do a Windows like 11 like layout. To get the full Windows 11 type layout, you must pay $39 and get the pro version. Well, I'm not going to do that. At least I don't think I'm going to do that. And I think the screen that I've got that I'm going to share with you looks pretty Windows like anyway. Um, the touchpad gestures haven't seemed to work for me. And so that's something I'm going to continue to do because I've been concerned about active windows or workspaces. And it's supposed to allow me with a three finger pinch to change the workspaces that I'm on. And it doesn't seem to work. A four finger swipe is supposed to. So I'm still checking that one out. Um, Zarin has an, a, um, I don't know if overlay is the correct term. It has a layer which is combined with wine. And it is supposed to um, run Windows programs out of the box. And in the demonstration um, on YouTube, which I'm about to just click on real quick, um, he shows that when you do this, it may say that you have to install additional support. So I haven't tried that yet, there it is. He says, if it doesn't have exact instruction for Windows, it prompts you to install Windows app support, which is adding more wine, if you will, to the mix. So <clears throat> that, that will then make, make things work better. It's supposed to, so I gotta try that out. Uh, some specific apps that are unique to Zarn, it's got a new photos app. They say it's, it's got a good, Straightforward, clean photo management app. We'll see. Um, as I said, it's it's got repositories, so it's got flat pack applications um, and snap applications. Uh, it's got the ability to do taskbar and dash customization. It gives you unread icons and progress bar. It has a new sound recorder app. So it says, have you tried it yet? And so on. Okay, so this is um, a popular guy on um, YouTube. He's got a channel called Explaining Computers. I like some of the things that he's done. Um, just very quickly, you'll see this is his. So he's he, he literally walks through 20 minutes of installing setting it up, configuring it. So if, if in fact you want some hand-holding and exactly what to do, you can start his video, go through the process with him and, and get set up and running with Zorin. Uh, let's see what else we got. All right, this is Mike, something, what was something his else. His name, his what name is, uh, okay, what is his name? Not Anthony Salter. Let's see, explaining computers. Uh, hang on, let's see if he says who he is. Christopher, Christopher. Barnett. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see if there's anything else I want to show before we actually go to it. 
Uh, so we looked at the features, the video tutorial. Okay, so let's actually switch. Oh, I got rid of the video controls, didn't I? <laughs> okay, so that is, help me, John, control what? Back, control shift H. I think it's H. There we go. Yes, that came back. All right. So I want to stop stop share. Okay, got it. Okay. So let me now share the screen of the Zarin computer. This will take a minute for the boxes to go away. Mm -hmm. And we're just stuck with a couple of little boxes up here. Now I'm just going to try, John told me I could just go ahead and change to a different, no, it's not going to go to the, no, it's not going to go to the second. I wanted to go to a different workspace and, and see if I could get rid of that little, these boxes. Yeah, but, you, you might've been on it, but both desktops will look identical until you put something on one of them. Ah, uh, you know I got to do it. On the right. other one. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to leave it where it is. So it's a clean screen, OK? Uh, can you see the bottom of the screen where my mouse is? Yes. Yes. OK, good. So you can see that the super key, it now has a Z for Zorin. And in that, you've got a system menu. You can configure this menu a number of different ways. I chose just to leave it in default. Unlike mint the individual items don't just immediately show you what's there but you can just choose accessories and there they are and then you can go back so games and you can go back and graphics and you can go back and internet and you can go you can go back system tools Office has LibreOffice, uh, has Evolution, which is for email. So uh, here's another email client, Donna. Uh, <laughs> no, no idea whether it's better or worse than Thunderbird, but it's, an e it's another unique email client. Haven't yeah, tried it. It would be the one that would be like the uh, Microsoft one because it is multi-purpose you know thunderbird is just email this one has the email the contacts the well, task here, manager I'll, I'll click on it i haven't done anything with it but let's see what it let's see what it does so it's welcome to evolution receiving email so this is the basic setup and then there it is on this computer inbox if i had anything there's no messages from to subject date and I'm going to assume it might have a preview panel that I could, let's see, window, mail, contacts, calendar, layout, show menu bar, preview, show message preview. So it does say, as you're going down through the messages, you'll see a preview. So it's got, it's got stuff, all kinds of things that you can play with just to see if it, if it works. So. <laughs> Okay, um, and Firefox is the browser I put. Okay, now they, I am told, even though this has Google search by default, that the Firefox that's on here has been privatized. What, you know, in order to give greater privacy settings, I can't confirm or deny that. I still prefer to, I put Brave on, if I just got the Debian package for Brave. I did not have to do any special terminal commands to have it come in and it, you know, it walks you through the settings and so on. Uh, let's see, what else might be in the, the software store? So this has, um, this shows you everything that that's installed to start with. Let me see if I can, I've got, it's up above my screen sharing thing. But anyway, this is what's in here. So these are kind of the things that are here.
This is their the new photo package that they've got. Shows an example of it. I don't have any photos installed yet. No photos found. So with no photos found, I'm not gonna see anything, I guess. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have software, we got settings. Uh, these are basically your heart, your Wi-Fi, your network, your Bluetooth, backgrounds, which I changed. This is the background I'm using now. Zorn came with, with a mountain and looks like in Switzerland, uh, kind of like uh, maybe they're influenced by Proton Mail. I'm not sure. Uh, this is an actually an active background and it will change the sky based on the time of day locally. So you can actually get sunrise and noon and sunset, theoretically the evening as, as well. Um, if, if, that you put your, it in. if that floats your boat. So, okay, let's see what else we got here. Um, the usual home with the documents and folders. Here's the, the Snap Store, I guess. If you download some Snap packages, they'll show up here. Um, let's see, what else? That's, I mean, it, it is very, let's see, did I do appearance? Yeah, okay, so here's where you can adjust the layout of where your menus are. So if you if you truly want this to be Windows like, let's see what it did if I did that. Well, it's still putting it here. Maybe that's because it's not the pro version. No, click on the start. Oh, there we go. There's the start menu. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that changes the start menu. So now I got to go back to settings, right? Uh, now you're hiding on me. Where? Oh, page two. That looks like a Chromebook to me. Good old Windows 8. Yeah. Connectivity. Well, see, now that I've, I've messed myself up, I wanted to go back to the, me <laughs> the regular menu. <laughs> try, try doing a right click on the start icon. Zoom mm. appearance. Oh, no. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Thank you. Hello. Maybe I need to do this out of it. Let me go back out. Okay, then right click. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. There's that was that theme. All right. And and if you want uh, a, a an Ubuntu layout, your panel layout, you can get that. I'm gonna go back here though. This is what I want. Okay, so it's really not a lot to show per se. It's very straightforward, very easy. The installation, I feel the was easier and faster than Mint's was. Less questions asked and more capacity to adjust um, partition sizes without going into the more function. <clears throat> uh, but yes, if you wanted a petition for home and if you wanted a petition for um, your, your cash and so on, you could do that in, in the setup. So if you wanted greater control over the setup, you can do that. And I will either demonstrate or report next month on using some of the Windows capability. But if I can get... Um, if I can divorce myself from Quicken on Windows and get Quicken to run on Zorin, I may just be transferring my main computer to Zorin from Windows 10. We shall see to be reported. So I'm going to go back up here. Any questions before I leave this that you might want to look at? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So 
Let me swift switch computers. So resources, as last month, um, I have a link for the next uh, APCUG workshop that's Linux related. So even though it's not Linux, we've already had some questions about the Raspberry Pi. So coming uh, September 15th, which is next week, it's all about the Pi Raspberry Pi. And you want to register for that uh, before 1130 on the 14th, if you would like to do that. And John already told us, gave us a sneak peek at what's coming in October, but I look forward. Oh, no, no, that, that's what's coming in two weeks. Oh, that's going to be two weeks? Ah. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I, I thought that was going to be October. Okay, I didn't no, see that No, October is uh, partly your suggestion. Okay. Yeah, the workspace, workstations. Okay, I didn't or see that. I didn't see that come out yet announced. October, no, we haven't. No, but but, but is Linux... Uh, is September 22nd? I think is I'm that... on the 29th. We were, we were, we were trying to get uh, another security program uh, on the 22nd, and we got somebody who just changed jobs, may not be able uh, to get off. That's that. why, so that's why it I didn't come out. My extra one, it's not you know, going to be called the Learning Linux because that's supposed to be the third Wednesday. So uh, the next Learning Linux will be in October, and that's when we'll take your suggestion of uh, workspaces and okay. work on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to make myself a cue card and just paste it to the monitor because I'm terrible remembering commands when, and, making them, and making them work. Okay, um, as I say, thousands and thousands of videos and blogs, so if you truly want to start from square one and become a power user, alrighty, whatever that is, then this video looks interesting. I'm amazed he's not charging for it. And if I go to that, let's go back again. I have to move this down. Video controls, much easier to do this. Okay, so this is the complete Linux course. Beginner to power user. And he gives you everything he's gonna talk about. In, from introduction, distributions, and there's VirtualBox, how about that? Okay, uh, he's gonna do Ubuntu. Uh, he's administrative privileges commands, services, scheduling tasks, uh, stuff that I haven't even looked at. So you're looking at seven hours of, instru oh. of instruction. If that's what you want, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> wow. So, so and, and the nice thing about timestamps is you can jump to them or you can come back to them. So I may, I do want to do a session on command line essentials, one of our meetings. So I'll be looking at what he's got to say about that as, as resource material. Yeah. But um, inter interesting anyway, let's see. And the last thing I have here, okay, I'll just jump to social media. I still, recommend MeWe as an alternative to Facebook and many other social media sites. This is their Linux SIG. Here's literally the latest. Let's see if I can get the latest post up here by hitting refresh. So this is the latest report. Um, so they're talking about videos. This one's uh, an install of Arch Linux. Linux. Um, well, to get on, it's, it's an open, it's public, but you have to make one post and then a moderator will approve you. You just open, set up a MeWe account. Uh, he's talking about MailSpring. Now we're talking about mail clients. Here's one I hadn't heard of. John, had you heard of MailSpring before? Yep. Uh, I haven't used it, but at one of our last, uh, oh no, in my free 
uh, free software ones, I uh, present MailSpring as an alternative to uh, other ones along with Thunder, Thunderbird. So yeah, that was a new one I had. Okay, I so used it yet, but something else for Donna to check out and report back. <laughs> We're going to yeah, make you a, our primary mail, mail investigator, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would try it. Yeah, you never know. Here's a review of, of Manjaro Budgie. I mean, there are distros and distros and distros, all kinds of, you know, comments. Some of them, well, interesting. Some of them not. But, you know, it's a great place. Just to mix and mingo. Here's Linux. Uh, here's Gecko Linux that somebody is saying. Polished out of the box usability. Uh, bo body Linux. Lightweight, fast, and fully customizable. Uh, and their comments and things that are awesome. So, you know, interesting place to go, interesting people to talk to. Uh, let's see what else I put on here. Uh, oh, and then uh, Reddit is a big support group, big social media support group. Lots and lots of people use Reddit for their technical support. And I just said there has to be a Reddit Linux users group, and there is. And it's uh, reddit.com dash r dash Linux users group. And that link is also in our presentation, which I will send out. And all you have to do is join and you're on Reddit. Actually, you'll set up a main Reddit account that's good in any of the user groups, which I have, and then you can just join the group if you wish and exchange information. And I think that's everything that I have here. Any comments, questions about what I have on the resources slide? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so as John normally does too, what do we want to talk about in the future? We pretty well covered everything this month that I wanted to cover, except I probably will do a follow-up on Zorn over the next month of how successful was I in trying to get uh, Windows programs to run. And to be fair, I'll probably uh, install Wine on Mint, and then I'll do a comparison. Is it easier or harder or the same to install and run a Windows program uh, on Linux Mint than it is on Zarin or vice versa? So I, that's probably one of my focuses for next month. And then we got, you know, this is something that I'm still working on, especially I'm, since, go ahead. <laughs> this is Donna, you know my issue. Again. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> Well, well, I'm very interested in that. <laughs> yep. I mean, one would think, why is it so hard? You know, and, 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 and yes, it can be done. I know it can be done. And, and with my Synology file station, it became more of a concern for me because now I have a, I'm using the Windows SMB uh, protocol on my file station so that I can then see it from Windows and see it from Linux. But I said, well, okay, now I want Linux to see my Windows computer and I want Windows to see my Linux computer. It wasn't so easy, still isn't so easy. So I'm still playing with that. And if John gets to it before I do, I welcome a workshop on that. But nope, uh, not for me. <laughs> you know, I, I i do the simple route i know p cloud i, just, I have a p, p cloud account and so yep. i put the files i want to share in the p cloud folder and it's available to whatever computer i run well donna i think before you came on told us of her problems with p cloud so i'm going to oh. investigate some of that i me oh i'll be interested on that too since okay um File types, definition, structure, and locations. Now this, it's not something that everybody does even on Windows. I mean, Windows, you know what the file type is by the extension, but in Linux, you don't, unless somebody decides to put an extension on it just to help you out. So files don't necessarily, a text file, for example, doesn't necessarily have .txt on the end of it. 
It's just a text file. <clears throat> you can open it with a text editor. You can view it with a text viewer. So it helps to know what the different file types are and how they are stored in Linux, just so that you have an idea of where they are. I mean, you can use Linux and never even go into this at all until that day comes that you're trying to open a file or do a file association or you know, make something work. So probably this kind of thing might take up a good portion of one of our, our meetings. And with the focus on this coming up with APCUG, I will withhold virtual computers and machines until afterwards. And then we may have a follow-up in our local group based on what we learned from that. Um, this I will do. This will be a follow-up from what we did today. And we have been you know, deferring to terminal commands as we go. <clears throat> and as I recall, Orv in his last um, uh, Linux, Learning Linux workshop had a very good session talking about um, terminal commands. So um, what I'd like you guys to do is say, what are some of the things that we need to do that I want to do that I've been trying to do, but it seems like I've got to use terminal command to do it and how do I do it? So this could be a section that we cover or it could be a whole focus. And then any recommendations that you send me either tonight in our discussion, or you send me by email. Comments? Well, Everybody. for me, it's the second item, you know, sharing files. And then I guess wine would be interesting. I haven't looked at that, and I don't know what I'd have to share out of Windows with Linux. So I'd be curious on what they are sharing. My photos, maybe? I don't know. So. Well, the key is, as long as any of us keep a, Linux, a Windows computer on our network and a Linux computer on our network, and we work with them on a regular basis. You know, John's saying, yeah, just stick something up in pCloud and then pull it down, you know, on the other machine. And that's fine. But I'd also like to just click on the file manager and click on network, and there they are. Uh, I'll give you a for example. Let's me close this one. Let me let's see. Stop share, and let me share different screen. So if I go down here to my file manager and bring that in, file explorer. Okay. Here's my network right here, okay? So if I click on my network, it'll take a second for discovery to work. Why it instantane isn't instantaneous, I have no idea other than perhaps my Synology is sleeping and it's gotta wake up. Okay, so the computer I'm on is Asus and my Synology is Hawkeye 115. All right, so I can see my file sharing. It's, a, it's an NAS drive, basically. And I know Donna can have one. <clears throat> so on my NAS drive, I have put a common folder. And in my common folder, I have put the Linux SIG. And now I can go to my Linux computer and do the same thing. I can look at the network. I can see my file share, my NAS and I can see this folder, and I can get to these items. So if I wish, while I'm sitting in the other room with my laptop, and I'm browsing to this area, I can open up September, I can open up the presentation, and I can edit it while I'm thinking about it. But you'll notice I've got one, two, three other computers, Linux computers here, and I'm not seeing them. And they're all using ESMB command, and they all have Samba on them. So with network discovery, 
I should at least see the computer names if I haven't shared folders and they're not there. So I continue to try to figure out, okay, on my, on my Windows computer, why don't I see it? Now on my Linux computer, I see Asus. But when I go to open it up, I don't see the drives and I have shared my D drive under Windows 10 and I've made it available to anybody, period. No password required, period. Read write access, period. And I should be able to see that drive on all my Linux computers. I don't see it. So I continue to investigate. And believe me, I've been to the forums. Why don't I see it? I said, well, they say, do this, do that. Go into the uh, command line, go into the shell, give these commands, give those commands. Still don't see it. So I continue to try to scratch my head and figure out why that is. So that's, that's something I'm, I'm working on all the time anyway. Closing comments. Okay, well, we've no. been uh, a little over two hours. Yeah. I thank you for joining us. And for those that couldn't join us tonight, the, you'll be watching this video and I will go back through the resources. I wasn't uh, transcribing as I went. I may try something that, that Huey was talking about where you get a video and you run your audio through um, word recognition and it will give you a complete transcript. And I may hunt for some of the little tips and techniques that you guys came out with and put them in the description of the video so that we can have some of those recommendations. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. I know you've had nice a busy day, John. Tonight, Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. And see everybody another time. All right. Take care. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.